Hello, this is Bill Morgan, president of Parker University, and I have two special guests with me today. Dennis Short. Hi. And his wife, Kelly Short. Both chiropractors, both practicing in Kentucky. Kentucky. So we've had an interesting discussion over lunch about many things, business of chiropractic, the practice of chiropractic, where we're going, what do recent graduates view as successful, what is success, and uh, you know where should we be going? Can you tell a little bit about your practice and your business in Kentucky? Uh, we've been in practice now for 18 years. Um, husband and wife started together, uh, one location. Took a while to get get successful, but uh, now we have nine offices, and I just last week hired on my 19th associate, so there's 19 of us in those nine offices, all around central Kentucky, all rural, so our business model is rural America. We don't really particularly like the cities for a lot of reasons, and we can get into that reasons if you want to, yeah. but but that's we, we stay rural. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. So are you are you both practicing now? I am actively practicing. I'm still say, working two days a week seeing patients and the other three managing business stuff. And you have kids too. We have three kids. Uh, I don't practice anymore. Uh, about a year, year and a half ago, I stepped out because obviously when you're managing nine offices and plus I have other businesses as well, uh, when you're managing nine offices, it's difficult to see patients. Uh, you know, it's interesting when you were, when I was early in practice, the most effective monetary thing you could do is see patients. Now it's not. So if I see a patient, you know, I make less money than I do when I'm ma managing people. Okay. So, you know, it's, 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 a, state, it's, it's, a, it's a platform, it's a, 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 what's the word? You just stage yourself higher up yeah. in, in management. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you can have more of an influence when you have 19 people working for you than you can with yourself. Right. Oh, true. So if you really so want to spread, yeah, so if you really want to spread chiropractic, the way to do it is to clone yourself, not to think you're going to do it all. Truly, and well, that's a mentality that a lot of people have problems. Well, with. that's why I'm, I'm, I've I've come to Parker as you know as a chiropractor. I could I could adjust probably tens of thousands of people in my life. Mm -hmm. But how many can you teach? But with a thousand chiropractic students at Parker now, I'm going to be meet, reaching millions, tens right. of millions of patients. So a thousand it, students, congratulations! That's awesome. Yeah, it's yeah. It's, it's great. It's uh, we're we're growing like, like by gangs, but gangbusters. So. We were talking about success and about internships, or not internships, but um, associateships versus going into practice. What's, what Do you think a chiropractic student should graduate and go into private practice right away? You want to take this or you want me to take this? I'll take it. I don't. I think it's, we did it and I'm glad we did it. Um, we did it at a different time when it was easier to get a loan. Um, you didn't need, you made better money per patient than you do now if you take insurance. But it was a long learning curve because it was just us. We had each other, which was awesome. But we still graduated at the same time, had the same information to work with, and really didn't know what we were doing for business. We knew how to adjust the patient. We were both awesome at that. We loved people, so we were great at that. But we sucked at the business. And so that was three years. So like had a similar experience, three to five years to kind of get that momentum. And I think if you even took the time to do one year with somebody, learn how to run a front office, learn how your software works, learn how to talk to the patient, learn how that patient, you know, teach that patient, hey, we talk to a patient again, we come in. It's not a, you, you know, I need to see you three times next week. I don't need to see you at all. You need to see me three times next week. It's a huge difference. How you message it. How you message it. We do compliance numbers in our offices. Like if you scheduled 200 people this week, how many come in? How many kept their appointments? And we have doctors with close to 100% compliance. And it's because of how they word their, what they say to the patients. And you don't learn that if you're by yourself. No. You know, I can teach someone what you would say, how you would say it, not just how you adjust the baby or work with someone who's pregnant, but how you treat those patients, how you word things, how you think about yourself, just to teach that confidence. So when you go out, you don't have as high a chance of failure. And you were also talking about the confidence level you see of recent graduates, not from all the schools. Just all of them. Oh, I have, I have uh, associates right now from pretty much every school in America. Okay. The ones are 16 different schools, but really there's, you know, there's two uh, life, there's three uh, Palmers, but I have somebody from every school that works for us right now, so we don't see it any different anywhere at all. You know, they all come out and they're a little scared and their confidence is not there. And it's better to get your confidence when you're being paid than to go out there and try to cut your teeth and get your confidence on when you're not getting any money because you're going to be bankrupt. Because one of the things you got to understand is that you could say, okay, I did my math, and I'm going to really make a, a real uh, 
a small office and I'm going to open it up for $20,000, $30,000 something, which is ridiculously cheap, but let's say you can do that. What you don't understand is that it may take you a year to turn profitable. And if that's the case, did you have enough money for your overhead for a year? So you could be bankrupt before you get started. So you need to really hit the road running. There are a few people that have the personality to do that. If you're the person that, you know, like you couldn't talk me out of chiropractic, I'm the most passionate person in the world, and I, I will talk to anybody, I don't care if it's the President of the United States or the homeless person, I will talk to everybody. You could probably do that, assuming you had enough money to get out of, you know, to open up and do all that stuff. But uh, the majority of people don't. The reality is most people get out of school and they don't have the confidence to do it, and they don't have the knowledge. So why would you go out and try and reinvent that when you can go and work for somebody and get that? Now, the associate position you get makes a big difference. Absolutely. You can go to get an associateship somewhere, and they teach you nothing. They don't know how to bill and code. They don't know how to document. They don't know how to do HIPAA regulations. They don't know how to do Medicare. They don't know how to adjust people. They don't know how to communications, treatment plans. They don't know anything. And if you leave and you don't know how to do any of that, that was a bad associateship. It's almost like they want, it's state secrets. They don't want to teach you. Oh, truly. And you need to find that person to work for that's going to teach you everything. Literally, how to run the front desk. If you don't know how to run the front desk, how do you know your staff's doing it correctly? Yeah. How do you know your staff is saying the right stuff? I agree. You need to know from how to mop the floor to how to pay all the bills to how to do the CPA's job. I think you need to know every single part of that. So if you can find an associateship that will teach you all of those levels, not hide the details, yeah. that's what you need. And we make sure we teach everybody everything. That's great. You're empowering them. Well, part of the, the, the pay is the, the, oh, absolutely. what they pay them, but also knowledge. As long as you're learning something, you should stay yeah. with that associate. When, you, when you've when you already, you're, you're, then when you've already completed a, your education, then you can talk whether it's time to go or not. Absolutely. And not everybody wants to do have their own. You know, my first associate I ever had was 11 years ago, still with me today. That's great. You know, because it's a great place to work. And you take care of him, though. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, he makes a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, after talking to you, I'm thinking about applying for an associateship. Um, but that's, you know, that's... The, there's horror stories out there, and I, what happens is the practice management groups share those horror stories so much that mm-hmm. it scares my students into o- only wanting going into into private practice themselves, straight up. Yeah. We, love, we love hiring those people yeah. because they, they've seen how bad it is, and then they come in, they're not coming fresh out of school, too, that they think this is the way it is. So they've seen, they've been, we've had some that have been treated horribly, and so to have them come in, we even have one doctor, maybe it was a low collection month, and it, most of the collections were his. And he, when we paid him, he's like, I didn't think you were going to pay me. I'm like, you earned it. What are you talking about? Oh, my goodness. He said, well, my last doctor would have just said, well, we'll have to catch you when that later the office can't afford it. Like, yeah. So they, but, I'm like, but, it's your money, man. You know, because they're going to pay you on a per patient basis. So it's theirs. I would never think about not paying my associates. But that's a reality in happens. some of this stuff out there. So, so some big horror stories out there. We've heard horror stories. And what's got, got me is I've see, you'll see somebody get hired and the associate's doing better than the primary doctor. Right. And instead of like, you know, I made a great hire, they're jealous. Yeah. Well, what's yeah. your reason to hire an associate? Oh, yeah. Well, so there's three reasons to hire an associate. Two of them are really bad. The first one is I want <laughs> someone to help me grow this office. If you can't grow this office, why may you think someone at Shredded School can do it? That's not a good reason to, 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 uh, to do it. The next one is, oh, I want to have some free time. I want to spend more time with kids. That's not a bad reason, but you want to take a pay cut if you get an associate to do that because they're going to see the patient you're mm-hmm. not. There's really only one reason to get an associate is I'm so busy, I can't do this myself. That's the only real reason to do it. So if you're out there looking for an associateship, but what you're seeing is this guy's really not doing very much, don't dare go in there. Yep. Don't go in there. He, he can't feed you. He, you need to have somebody who's going to feed you patients. If you're out there trying to drum up your own patients, but you, you don't have the skill to do it, the communication skills to do it, you don't have the, the, the confidence level to do it, you're not going to do it. He couldn't do it. That's true. That's that's some sage yeah. wisdom there. So, as we talked, also the future of chiropractic and where we're going because we you know we're all in the in the success business. We want chiropractors to succeed, and we don't want them to fail. What are some things you'd recommend? You give re- recommendations you give to a new graduate. Um, look, uh, when you're opening up a practice, there's really just like any sports team. There's offensive and defensive. 
Okay, the offensive stuff. So I want to grow this business. I want to adjust as many people as I can. I want to get paid as much as I can. That's an offensive player. The defensive player is the person who says, aha, uh -huh, don't forget, there's HIPAA regulations. And your documentation has to be this way. And you must bill and code and make sure it's all of this. And you got to have Medicare compliance and OSHA regulations. And you got to make sure you have your HR law. And to, that's defensive stuff. That's the stuff to make sure that the government don't come in and shut you down. Most chiropractors are very offensive, but they don't have a clue about the defensive. Now, I hate the defensive. I'll be I the first it. one to tell you, I hate it. She likes it more than I do. <laughs> but I hate it so much that I hired on an internal HIPAA and compliance officer. So you know what? I pay her and say, you go audit the charts. You make sure the billing and coding is done. You do the OSHA regulations. You do the HIPAA regulation. So I'm at least successful enough now that I'm like, whew, I shed that bad skin that I don't want to deal with. So I, I don't I don't deal with that. But you gotta understand, it's still there. Just because you don't want it, it doesn't mean it's not there. But the you, government will shut you down. But you've grown big enough where it's not your headache, you can hire somebody. Right. So that's why people love to come work for us because they can come in and they can be chiropractors. That's what they wanted to do. They didn't want to do HIPAA regulation. They didn't no. want to do Medicare compliance manuals. They're this thick. You know, there's the amount of stuff that's out there that can kill you right now is like never before. We have been wanting for decades to be a part of this, the regular social side of medicine, the Medicare, the Medicaid. We want to be accepted. But you got to understand, to be accepted, you had to take on the same regulations as a hospital. So, and with that... The hospital has, I, I've been a hospital-based chiropractic most yeah. of my career, dozens, dozens of people of administrators. dealing with Jayco. And now my school here, we're growing, not just for the sake of growing, but every time Washington comes up with a, a new rule, I have to hire somebody yeah. to, 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 for compliance. That's and too. again, as a business, what happens? That cuts your profit margin down yep. because you had to have a middle manager to do that. You, now, if you're straight out of school, you can't afford you or your front staff, let alone go off and have a middle management. So that's why it's so difficult. Now you have to have all these hats. I got to be a HIPAA officer, and I have to be an OSHA regulator, and I have to be the chiropractor, and I got to run this business, and someone's got to pay the bills. I got to be the CPA. I got to, you know, how can you do all these things? So only someone who actually has a real multiple personality disorder can be all that. And so that's not healthy. So again, that's why I think the future of chiropractic is large organizations like ours, where you can go out and say, hey, I can go off and give these things that chiropractors don't want to do to somebody I can hire them because I got enough profit margin to do it. And that you know, and like makes that, a good place to work. We, love, we have a great social group. So we moved from being at Palmer and having 200 friends to, who had the same goals, the same hopes, the same fears, to Central Kentucky with each other. And that was horrible. It was very hard. We love, you know, it was we, love we had each other at least, but it was, we went from having this constant input that kept you confident, kept you strong. Social to, butterfly. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We were both, you know, very social to, oh crap, there's nobody here. Well, now we have, uh, again, we have this big group of people that if I have a question or he has a question or one of our docs has a question, we just send it to the whole group. Hey. You're all on mission. Yep. And yeah. so you constantly have this feedback and the support from, for us, 19 different chiropractors that you can bounce this idea off. So do you, like, when you have, not, chiropractors can't walk by an x-ray without stopping to look at oh, it. Oh, I know. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. So if, if there's a questionable finding in an, an oh, x-ray, do you put it up there and just leave it in the hallway so everybody well, stops? We just, we're all in different, well, we're that different would be offices. Hip oh, that right. would be a HIPAA violation. But so, that's right. But we in do, the doctor's lounge. I mean, yeah, there you go, but we right. do cover the name and we, we send it out in the text. And so, yeah. you know, do you, what do you think this is? And so you'll have- X-rays are amazing. Uh, they, an iPhone takes so much good pictures of an x-ray is unbelievable. So oh, an x-ray you send it to all of our 19 docs they all feed back in within five minutes that looks like this this and that you know so it's like you get your own people oh that, my goodness it's so good right? brain yeah. trust yeah yeah we awesome. do well and i specialize in pediatrics and ob and nutrition is incredible to me so i have those specialties and we have sports docs and we have neurology docs i mean so it's neat to throw out like someone say hey i have this kid i'd like to try this what what do you recommend and so they can shoot a text to the group and i may have the answer or another doctor may have the answer and so you're not by yourself you're not a little island so having that culture, we've been able to continue that, and it, it's amazing. I love it. Mm -hmm. And you're part, part of our point one group that we sponsor or that we try to foster, mm -hmm. which makes you the point one percent that of the high performing high, high, hiring highest performing highest performing chiropractors in the profession. So you guys are been successful. You've been at the mountaintop. You know what works, and you have a passion for helping other chiropractors. We do, and I think that's the difference. Is we don't have 
associates making sixty thousand dollars a year. Yeah. We don't have them doing spinal screens all day and not adjusting people. We set up a structure that one you can make an incredible amount of money, but that you have the opportunity to grow. So yeah. I think that makes it more fun for us, but it's also a chance to teach and lead and then help these docs become leaders. We haven't had a whole lot of doctors leave us because they get to become, we call it parent doctors, they get to have other doctors under them that they then teach. And they and may, make money on And as make well. money on as well. And then they may open, maybe they have multiple offices that they, they manage and they run. So they get as much as you want to grow, you can. And we have a few docs who see patients and go home. And That's all they want to do. Yeah. But we have those that want to grow, that want to be more, that we can teach that as well. So the people that have a tendency to go through associates quickly mm -hmm. are because they're very win-lose type people. They don't want the, the associate to win. They just want to win themselves. So, hey, I'm going to get you to see 300 people a week, but what you're going to do is I'm going to pay you $50,000 a year. Well, guess what? At some point, that associate is going to say, I'm getting smart to this. This is foolishness. <laughs> I've learned all I can learn. I'm, get, I'm hitting the road. But you don't have to do that if you say, I'm just going to pay them based on what they're doing, how they're performing. So we got doctors making $200,000 a year as an associate. They don't have any of the headache of a business. Okay, we take care of that. And that's going to allow us to grow because we're also saying, it's not just about me. How can I train these people so that they can know all the knowledge that I know and be a part of this group, but I don't want them to leave. You don't want your patients to leave. No. So you don't create a system. They say, okay, it's going to be horrible if this patient stays. So the patient is going to leave because like, this is horrible. So you don't want your patients to leave. And as a businessman, I don't want my associates nor my staff to leave. So we foster a situation where this is better to stay than to leave. Yeah. And also at the end of the day, because one day we we're, you know, we were looking back in our lives like, you know what? I really helped a lot of people. I helped yep. a lot of patients. I helped a lot of chiropractors. Right. I, I helped a lot of families. You, you guys are providing the wherewithal to raise 19 families. Yeah, I absolutely. mean, you're you're helping 19 families grow and 40 like, families. We have staff. Oh, that's too. right. <laughs> so, that's right. But but that's part of it. I mean, that's part of your satisfaction. I yep. mean, absolutely. if you're a creator, you want to create something of beauty that that others are blessed by. What I think is cool, though, if you look at that, the Point One Club, all of them have employees. And if you look at it, they all have very, very well compensated employees. So the ones who are succeeding the most are also paying the people who are helping them get there the most. Right. Why is that? So it, it's just, it's amazing. So, so it's, you know, everybody wants to, I want to open my own business. There are associateships out there that are incredible. You just have to look. You have to learn how to read a contract. You have to have somebody help you read a contract. And don't sign it if it doesn't sound right or if it sounds too good to be true. Yeah. So what can I do to prepare my students as they get close to to graduating and going on their own to enter the enter the business world? Knowledge is the beginning, but it is not everything. It's the application of knowledge. So knowing and not doing has no value. So learn all you can about the business of chiropractic. You guys are graduating students that are artists. They are great chiropractors. Yeah, sure, they can tweak their art and they can work under somebody and learn how to adjust babies or whatever the case may be. So yes, they can tweak that art, but really that's not enough to be successful. Learn the business of chiropractic, okay? Next thing is learn the art of effective communication. If you can't look someone in the eye and say, this is gonna take 15 visits, you're gonna struggle because sometimes it takes 15 visits. Not everybody, but sometimes it do. And also, research is saying it takes three times a week, not once a week for 15 weeks, three times a week. And that's what gets people well. So you have to have the confidence and the communication skills to communicate that, that this is what it's gonna take in order to get you well. And you know what? They're gonna have to pay for it. A lot of students mm -hmm. have this poverty mentality. Most, you know, Larry Markson talked a lot about it, mm -hmm. where they say, you know what, we all grew, uh, most chiropractors grew up in blue collar families. And so we were paid by the hour and we thought, oh my, that's a lot of money. So the reality is we need to kill that person inside of us that is worried about the money thing. Reciprocity, you're gonna do a service, you're gonna get paid for it. If you do that service and you don't get paid for it, you have just broken that law of reciprocity. You'd have. And the reality is you cannot run a business, you cannot function out there unless you make a profit and you cannot grow. So start becoming confident enough to say, you are going to pay me or you cannot stay. Bingo. That's the confidence. Absolutely. Right.
And so that takes time, no doubt. And again, another reason for an associateship, right? Sure. Go out instead of going off and learning that, you know, you should right. learn that under somebody else's tutelage, <laughs> not and, do it yourself. And also, your your mentor will say, you know, here's how you have to, you, you know, you word do it. it. Here's how you word it. You know, if you if you grovel to them, you know, you're you're you know, you have to look at them in the eyes. You have to know, you know, if somebody adjusts the patient one or two times and say they're not getting better, well. Certainly, yeah. somebody with chronic low back pain, they're not going to get better. It's been better. 30 not years, two. twice is not going to do it. No. no. You need to put the time there. And that's one of the things, you know, because we've all been through all the seminars. You put on a lot of them, let's face it, it is. So we hear the success stories, and but we don't hear the failures or the struggles. Mm-hmm. So we say, oh, I will put my hands on people and everybody will get well. And so students then get out of school thinking that that's what this is. All I need to do is adjust someone once and they will, the cripple will walk. And that is not what the reality is. It does happen, and those things are great, but they're gravy on top of it. It is not the reality. The reality is you're going to have to work, and that patient will not want to come in, and they don't want to pay. So it's up to you to motivate them to keep coming in, to show them their progress, to see what needs to be done in order to get them to the promised land. And say, you know what? I can take you to the promised land, but you're going to have to pay for it. You also talked about, when we were over lunch, the struggles and the failures. You failed forward. You know, you, the, you know, you rose from the ashes of the failure to have the great success. That without the failures, yeah, you couldn't have be where you're at now with great success. Absolutely. Yeah. So most people, when they fail, they never get back up. You know, Mike Tyson said he said everybody's got a plan until I hit them in the face. Right. Yes. And so most people, when you hit them in the face, they go down and they do not get back up. And so that in the real world is a failure. Someone who says, I got knocked down and I didn't get up. But you, if you're still alive, you haven't failed yet. Get up, do it again, and learn from it. Yeah, call it a learning experience instead of a failure because yes. you learn. Success is wonderful, but you don't learn nearly as much as you do. Like, ah, oh, that didn't work. Let's. So now what? Now, now is when the brainstorming starts. Now mm-hmm. is when you start, okay, what could I have done differently? What could I change? You know, what could we implement? What do we, how do we change this wording? What you know, what do we do? And you start brainstorming, and things. That's when the big stuff happens. Yeah, I like calling it tuition. Oh tuition. yeah, <laughs> yeah. And more funny you say that because uh, I told her, that, you know, um, yes, I graduated 20 years ago, and and I had a scholarship, so I graduated with 120 thousand dollars in student loans. I know that's only about half of what they do these days, but I graduated with 120 thousand dollars in student loans. My fourth office I opened up went bankrupt. Okay. And when we did the calculations, right at about $250,000 I lost. So what I did is this. I got a big legal pad, and I said, two PhDs worth of knowledge I got to get out of this. Wow. I have a doctorate degree and my undergrad for 120. So I just waste two times that. I better go off and figure out how do I get double the knowledge. And when I started planting that seed, that's when the creativity comes and say, okay, mm-hmm. this is where you went wrong. You went wrong here, here, here. Never do this again. Make a pledge to yourself. You'll never do that again. And so you can use your failures as a stepping stone to grow to bigger and better things if you got your eyes and ears and your mind open. But if you don't, you just go out and rinse and repeat, you will fail again. Well, it sounds like that's what set you guys apart. You failed. And you learn from your failure. Yeah, absolutely. Get we, up. We, we've, said, we've said you you save a lot of money by being poor. Oh, that's a good <laughs> one. We, my wife and I were, we were setting up our practice. You know, we, we were, you know, we were, we were working hard. And I remember there's some other chiropractors. They were funded by this, uh, this guy's father-in-law. Started off the best of everything. everything. Yeah. And where we shopped, we scrimped. We, you know, we had a nice practice, but we did we were very frugal. And they had the best of everything and zero pa- patients the day they opened the door. Yeah. Yeah. And they eventually failed. Their upkeep was their downfall. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, <laughs> it's, you can have the best of everything. You grow into the best of everything. But the patient right. doesn't care. Yeah. The patient wants someone who cares about them, someone who will actually put hands on them and make eye contact. Every day I hear, I went to my medical doctor. He never even looked at me. I went to the orthopedic with the knee problem, and he never put his hands on my knees. Crazy. What are you doing? No, so we have the most incredible opportunity to be the leaders in healthcare because we will still look at the patient, we will still touch the patient, we will still talk about the patient, and we love our patients. They're not getting that anywhere else. We love, we love our patients. Uh, truly, I we mean, love. I, it, it really, like we had our, our main speaker today at the seminar, he was talking about, you know, he wasn't really into passion. I think, actually, we all are passionate about what we do, and we really Absolutely. do love our jobs. I mean, if you're doing it right, you know, 
Yeah. I, I wouldn't want to. You said it earlier. You wouldn't want to be anything else no, but a chiropractor. No, I think there's a lot of chiropractors that have an inferiority complex that they w- wish, oh, well, I'm never going to be a medical doctor and the world doesn't see yeah. me that way. I wouldn't be a medical doctor for all the tea in China. I'd rather be right where I am. This is the best place to be in healthcare. Yeah, I agree. The people that have trouble with that, just think about this now. Let's say, how many teachers out there right now are saying to their, to their kid, little boy, little girl, saying this, son, you can be whatever you want to be when you grow up, but don't be a teacher. Because what does that tell you? That tells you that person had bad experiences. Ooh. Right? Yeah. Or, son, you can be whatever you want, but don't be a medical doctor. How many chiropractors are saying that right now? Son, you can be whatever you want, but don't you be a chiropractor. It's too hard. Go off and go to medical school. Oh, my goodness. I'm looking at my kids and like, you can do whatever you want, but you should probably think about being a chiropractor. Yeah. Why? Because I was successful doing it. I ha- If you're failing on everything, it's easy to try to say, it's not me. It it's- was the profession. It was the town. It was the thing. Or the world is not ready for this or whatever. No. If you're successful, however, you'll try to get your next prodigy to go off and do it again. Do it Take again, responsibility again. for your own life. Yeah. That's you got to do that. You just got to do that. And so, you know, you got to take your own life in hand, absolutely. But you got to make some smart decisions. And you do have to realize you're going to get out of school and you're not going to know everything. The school teaches you how to be an artist, but there's a lot more that's required. Yeah. Well, one of the big mistakes I think most leaders will have is they think they have to know it all anyway. Right. If you don't know it, Hire someone who does. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> yeah. And the Henry Ford that was, wasn't oh, it? Oh yeah. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I hit this button. Someone tells me. Yeah. And we talked about confidence, and I also shared that uh, you know, if, if these residencies and hospitals, these internships with chiropractic students from nine different schools would come through our, our hospital, and by the time they left, they I guarantee would look you in the eye, shake your hand. They did not feel second to any medical doctor because they no. were working right next to medical doctors and and. Um, medical students and interns they knew more and they knew more i mean it was it was it was when, when it was, certainly with neuromusculoskeletal yeah it's amazing no it's question is you probably don't know more about you know aspergillus of the lungs yeah it's Inter- not your world internal medicine they got us right but right. I, I i learned that early i was probably in my second year of practice and a nurse from a local family doctor called me and said dr short do you have any exercise sheets over there for you know we could get a loan mm-hmm. of to give some exercise to our patients. I go, sure, you can have whatever I want. What's the diagnosis? They goes, well, low back pain. I goes, I understand the patient has low back pain, but what's the diagnosis? He goes, well, low back pain. And at that point, it was ICD-9. I goes, I understand that 729.1 is low back pain, but it's a non-differentiating diagnosis. What is the problem? Is there a hyperlordosis? Is a hypo? Is there an ileal psoas problem? Is there a piriformis? Is there a herniated disc? Is there a facet syndrome? What is it? I said, if you give them the wrong exercise, you're going to make them worse. And she goes, he doesn't know any of that. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, you should probably send him here. She said, yeah, I'll send that patient over to you. <laughs> right? yeah. And they don't know. And it's, I'm not being judgmental. Oh, no, it's no. just not their world. I think, too, we built a huge referral practice. So he's joking about the doctor, but we're literally a third medical referral. We're getting referrals from the ER daily. Should be that be- way. Because they've changed the opioid stuff has really made it great for us because they can't do anything for them. They have to send them to us. So it's a great time for that. But we make we I don't have any concern talking to neurologists. I don't have any concern talking to the anesthesiologist doing injections. Because I, I have, have orthopedic just orthopedic surgeons that are paying my patients. Yeah. They come and see me. They come and see us as well. So we can ha- very comfortably carry on a conversation. They know we know what we're doing. I love medicine, thank God for it. So I'm not anti. I'm not telling mm-hmm. the patient with a torn labrum, don't go get surgery. So you know, it's a it's great when we all work together. So if you can give that patient that joint care that they have an MD, a PT, you on, on board, that's when they're going to get better the quickest. I mean, it's well, it's awesome. Thank you both for being here today. If you were to give us a, just a synopsis of where you think healthcare is going as far as... Um, you give yours, and then I'll give oh, mine. Oh, <laughs> Where I'd like it to go, or... Where you, know, where you <laughs> think it's going. If you had a crystal ball and you could see, where's, what, where are we headed with this? And where's the puck going to hit for that Canadian side? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, th- I think we're in trouble medically because I think you're seeing, you are seeing the medical doctor telling their kids don't go into medicine. Their numbers are down dramatically and already seeing you can't get into medical doctor if you wanted to. So you're going to see more walk-in clinics and things like that. And so I think that's going to help us that we actually have the opportunity to be a huge part of a patient's life, that they're coming to you for more than just an adjustment, that you know everything about their health, that you're there for them. So I think we're really on track to be the leaders in healthcare in general. True health, not not sick care, mm-hmm. but healthcare. Yeah. Uh, for me, obviously, if 
some things don't change is not a very bright future for chiropractic. I'll tell you that right now. You know, we need to make chiropractors more successful. I'm not going to put a plug in for my book, but I'm putting a plug in for my book. Okay. <laughs> That is on Amazon. It's the number one selling chiropractic book on Amazon. And anyway, I put in there, I said, look, if you get out with $250,000 of student loan and you actually make what the government says you make, which is $70,000 a year, that is going to blow up in our face. Nobody, no student is going to keep go through school. You know, a lot of us, we went through school because we were passionate about what we were doing. As Larry Winger was mm -hmm. talking about, you know, what I get, that's an internal issue. You know, we were passionate about it. Students today are looking at like a math equation. Hey, I can go to this and make this amount of money. I can go this, this, make this amount of money. They're looking at it that way. So if we're not going to be a guaranteed success like medicine is a guaranteed success, you know, mm -hmm. you don't see many medical doctors failing. So if it's not going to be a guaranteed success, what you're going to do is you're going to see school enrollment go down, 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 down. So we have to make sure that chiropractors get more successful or we're going to, our profession is going to die slowly. And nobody wants to see that. At least no. nobody in this room. Okay. Well, and so, you know, we have to change that. So we need success to be the sort of the core principle and philosophy of the chiropractic schools now and of the students getting out. That's, that has to happen. Um, I do think that the future is going to be more chiropractically driven. I don't ever think we're going to dominate. You know, sometimes we get there and say, oh, you're going to dominate healthcare. No, you're not. Because the reality is, we believe it's absolutely necessary. The majority of the world out there would probably disagree with us. That, you know, if you have a brain aneurysm, an adjustment of your atlas is not what you need. Okay? So, so it comes down to it is, we're not going to go away unless the finances don't get better. Medicine is not going to lose their stronghold. They're just not going to do that. But I do think there's going to be more of an implementation where we're coming together. Okay. And you will see medical come down a little bit. And the reason is this. Most of their stuff, if you had to ask a medical doctor, is he a scientist or an artist? What would you think he would say? Scientist. And therefore, everything he does can be broken down to an algorithm. And you can, repo, you can program a smartphone to do that now. I have this symptom, da, 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 they give you diagnosis. I agree. So the reality is if you're a scientist, you're expendable because that's an algorithm. Chiropractic is an art and will always be. There's a science background to it, but it is an art. And if we ever lose the fact that we think it's not an art, we will go just to the dodo just like they will. So the reality is they're going to go down. They're not going to go away. We're going to go up as long as we say that we're an artist because you can't be shipped overseas. Mm -hmm. Okay. If, if you're, you know, you're an artist, you've got to come here to do it. A Rembrandt is a Rembrandt, not just the, 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 the kid down the street who just drawed something. Okay. So there's value in the artistry. So I believe that we can have a bigger influence in America. I do think that medical is going to lose a little bit. They're not going to go away. Mm -hmm. But if we don't change what we're doing, we're going to lose even faster. So we got to make sure that success is what we got to expect as the, the norm. Right now, the stats are scary and they're hard to really come by. but. Mm -hmm. Like we say, 65% of all chiropractors won't be practicing after five years. You know, those are, that's a common stat to hear. That's however that's plucked out of the year. Right. We follow our, yeah. we follow right. our, we you know, don't 90, know. 95% of our, our, our students are still practicing yeah. in five years. So those numbers, a lot of the numbers like that, the scary numbers are coming from practice management people right. and they We're pull them. To scare them. Well, I would say out of the, yeah, they're, they're using to recruit people to, to, to come to them. Yeah. And so, practice management is an interesting thing because it lumps everybody together and there's good and bad in mm -hmm. everything, of course, right? In religion and chiropractic and medical, mm -hmm. there's good and bad in everything. And some practice management groups are out there with a real thing trying to help people. Mm -hmm. The majority are just trying to, let's face it, line their own pockets by being fear mongers and trying to force you to a cash practice. I will tell you, it is much harder to open up a cash practice than it is an insurance. You grow into a cash practice. Now that I've been in practice for 20 years, I got a lot more cash than I used to have. But I'm telling you, starting right off, the people want to use their insurance. So you're better off at least starting an insurance practice. But practice management groups want you to do a cash practice. And the reason is they don't have to deal with the regulations. They can tell you all kinds of stuff that insurance just not going to allow. But for cash, it doesn't matter. You're right. Okay. So that's the reason they're pushing all that stuff. So they can go in and, you know, do a 50 treatment, treatment plans and all that stuff that insurance is just not going to allow. Let's mm -hmm. face it. You got 12 visits on your Blue Cross and you want to see me 50 times. It's just not going to work. Right. 
So, so practice management, they're looking at their future by going off and fear mongering a little bit. There's no doubt about it. So, but they're not all bad. Let's face it. No, no, no. Well, thank you both for being here and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks for coming down. Thank, thank you. you.